from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. Coming up on Ag Day. You don't come to college and not be stressed once. That's just, yeah. that's just not gonna happen. Learning life's lessons not taught in the classroom. Digging out and cleaning up following the bomb cyclone. And Washington turns its attention to a new round of trade talks. We do need to ratify a trade deal with uh, Japan because we are losing ground there. Ag Day, presented by the all new Chevy Silverado, the strongest, most advanced Silverado ever. Good morning, I'm Clinton Griffiths. U.S. trade officials are hosting their Japanese counterparts in Washington today in what is considered the first official meeting between the two countries for a bilateral trade deal. Ag Day's Betsy Gibbon joins us from the newsroom. Betsy, this deal also very important to U.S. agriculture. Clinton, there have been meetings to establish general guidelines on a potential deal between the U.S. and Japan, but this officially commences the bilateral negotiations. The industry hopes the end result is a deal for American ag. You could say a bilateral trade meeting with Japan has been a long time coming, a want and need for both pork and cattle industries. We do need to ratify a trade deal with uh, Japan because we are losing ground there. Number one on our list, which I think is the number one on the administration's list, is Japan. It's been a big priority for the administration and trade representatives. USTR even telling Ag Day a year ago it's a high priority, but major work needs to be done. With uh, Japan, they've said, well, we're reluctant to do a bilateral trade agreement with the United States. My reaction to that is very frustrating in that, well, you just did one with the European Union. However, starting today, the two-day trade talks are expected to be between US, US Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Japan's economy minister. A potential deal is expected to give both industries a big boost, one they need since some competitor countries have lower tariffs than the United States to Japan. We're still exporting more product to Japan, but from a tariff standpoint, we're losing ground. Not being a part of the updated Trans-Pacific Partnership is one reason why a deal is so urgent. And over time, will it have a huge impact? Yes, it, it, it most certainly could. I want to be open-minded enough that w the U.S. will have some agreement in place with Japan before it gets to that extreme. Reporting for Ag Day, I'm Betsy Chibbon. All right, thanks, Betsy. And an update on the trade talks with China. Top level U.S. and China trade negotiators holding meetings via teleconference discussing the remaining issues. A Chinese Commerce Ministry spokesman saying both sides will keep in close communication and spare no effort to continue negotiations. Bloomberg saying a sticking point in the talks continues to be China's reluctance to give up control over its domestic grain stockpiles. Now, Greg Dowd is the chief agriculture negotiator for the U.S. Trade Representative's Office. Dowd saying China subsidizes its domestic growers of corn and rice, and that unfairly boosts supplies and limits imports. USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue remains relatively optimistic a deal can be reached. Talks have been productive and uh, very direct about different issues. I'm happy to see that Secretary Mnuchin feels that the enforcement mechanisms, which have been a concern, have been resolved. Washington Insider is telling us the bottom line in these recent trade talks is that both Washington and Beijing are offering a final round of concessions, hoping they will lead to an agreement. China recently buying a large amount of U.S. pork product, and this may be the reason why. Reuters reporting up to 200 million pigs may die after being infected by African swine fever. Rabobank is forecasting that high number, which would be a large portion of the nation's pig herd. Now, Rabobank estimates the herd is about 360 million. China has reported 124 outbreaks since last August. And there is also movement on talks with the European Union. EU ambassadors approving a proposed mandate for the European Commission to conduct the negotiations on behalf of the 28 EU member countries. That's despite France expressing concerns over the U.S. intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement on climate change. Now, the U.S. has insisted on including agriculture in the negotiations, but the EU has resisted. EPA Chief Andrew Wheeler is signaling his agency may grant fewer small refiner waivers under the renewable fuel standard. 
Wheeler telling Reuters prices for renewable identification numbers have been lower for an extended period. He says that tells him there should be less economic harm in the refining industry right now than there was a year ago. The EPA also announcing it is reopening the comment period on the small refiner RFS exemption. Flooding continues to cause problems for barge traffic on major Midwestern waterways. Ten locks on the Mississippi River remain closed. This video from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers showing the power of the Mississippi during times of flooding flowing pretty fast there. That's according to USDA's weekly grain transportation report. Now, railroads also still recovering from last month's flood. And the flooding concern grows after a second so-called bomb cyclone hit the central part of the U.S. last week. Heavy snow, strong winds and rain, snarled traffic. People in South Dakota spent the weekend digging out from as much as 18 inches of snow. Hundreds of schools canceled classes in Minnesota, Nebraska, and South Dakota. And we're continuing to get in photos from you of that bomb cyclone. Meteorologist Cindy Clausen has more in today's crop comments. Cindy. Well, Clinton, we tracked this storm and it was powerful for sure, but being in it is a whole different issue. Check out this photo shared by Rhonda Williams in Wall, South Dakota. Now, Rhonda said there was more than a foot of snow on the ground at the time this photo was taken, and that was when they were trying to keep their livestock fed. Can't even imagine. Obviously a very powerful storm. We'll talk more about what's in store for us for the week ahead coming up, but for now, here are some hometown temps. Introducing Farm Journal TV, on demand 24-7. Ag Day, Machinery Pete TV. U.S. Farm Report, on your phone and tablet. Download the Farm Journal TV mobile app today. An update on the implementation of the Farm Bill. USDA announcing it will increase FSA loan limits, saying it's doing it to better provide producers with the line of credit needed while markets are lower and due to several natural disasters. However, Farmer Max says, according to its recent spring edition of the feed, fewer farmers are applying for those FSA loans. Uh, and it's really regional. So in the West Coast, the pullback makes sense. There's been a lot of profitability uh, from Washington down to California. In the Midwest, we've seen a little bit of an increase. Um, so it really is a regional picture where producers are accessing those loan products. Also in regards for the Farm Bill, FSA will open sign up for the new Dairy Margin Coverage Program starting June 17th. It will provide coverage retroactively to the start of the year. An Indiana farmer and former top producer of the year winner, Kip Tom, is joining the Trump administration. Tom, now confirmed by the Senate, is headed to Rome as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Food and Agriculture Programs. Tom was approved on a voice vote just before the Senate began its Easter recess. When we come back, we'll get you ready for the training week ahead with a panel discussion. That's today's analysis. And life skills are an important part of growing up. Well, up next, we'll see how a group of Tennessee 4 H'ers are helping to teach kids lessons for their future in the country. Join Andrew McRae for Farming the Countryside, a farmer focused podcast that is all about production agriculture. Farming the Countryside is available wherever you listen to your favorite podcast and is brought to you by Nutrien Ag Solutions, the world's largest provider of crop inputs and services. The trials and appeals processes are ongoing, but Bayer is headed for mediation over glyphosate. On Friday, the company agreeing to follow a federal judge's order to start mediation with yet another plaintiff claiming the company failed to warn about the cancer risk associated with the weed killer. Bayer agreeing to comply in good faith, but believes in the extensive body of reliable science supporting the safety of Roundup. Adding that the litigation is still in early stages with two verdicts and neither of the cases have run through the appeals process. Currently more than 10,000 cases are pending. Pressures for larger crop forecasts for Argentina and Brazil continuing to weigh on the markets. At the end of last week, here's an update from the CME. Today in the grain market, soybeans let's start it out a little bit firm today, but overall for the week, it's been a little bit lower. Exports are sluggish. The South American beans are really ready to hit the market, and that's putting a lid on any kind of significant rally. Uh, there has been no trade deal in sight, and that's really a recipe uh, for sagging prices, and that's what we're seeing right now. That's why we also see corn is steady today. It seems that the planting uh, disruption uh, offers a little bit of a price support 
uh, this is definitely from the uh, from the weather from the big storm that we've had and we know that there might be flooding some fields and so uh, this late winter storm should be delay some of that field work and that couple coupled with this the huge uh, U.S. stocks that we have is really like keeping the market in check. That's all from the floor at the CME Group here in Chicago. I'm Virginia McGaffey. Joe Vakovic with Standard Grain and Ken Smith-Meyer with Clipper Data, our guest here. All right, guys, let's look at what we learned last week, if we learned anything. And we had, you know, the USDA report come out. And Joe, we'll start with you. What was your takeaway from last week? We learned a lot of things that I guess we kind of already knew to some extent from the report. Uh, demand for corn especially is not as strong as USDA had been projecting in recent months. They cut really all the major demand base, I mean, ethanol feed exports were all cut, total of 200 million bushels um, of demand cut off the balance sheet, and that's a sizable amount. So now we're kind of back to where we've been the last couple of years, corn carry out, 2 billion bushels, burdensome supplies. Um, the thing that's different, of course, is the beans with the massive year over year supply build and, and the trade war, but this is a lot of stuff that we already knew. Yeah, Ken, as we start to look forward into this week and maybe into the rest of April, what are you watching as you know keys to the markets? Well, I'm watching the current weather because it's going to dictate how long our logistics are still going to be a mess, uh, particularly in the eastern Corn Belt. Uh, I do think we need to watch the Brazilian weather and make sure the, the Safrina second corn crop um, uh, goes through pollination and finishes okay. If it, if it doesn't, you know, Argentina has supply to fill in the gap, but we need to ensure that that's a decent crop. Um, and, and then, of course, I'm, I'm starting to look at planting. The southeast is off to a good start. And, um, you know, hopefully here after Easter, tail end of, of April, uh, we see more guys in the fields. Uh, but I, I think we'll know, uh, we'll, we'll get a better, picture, uh, better view of the story here in the next two weeks with weather and how that's going to impact planning. Yeah, Joe, too early to get worked up about weather? It is a little too early, and, and the market will tell you that. I mean, you look at the markets, and, and we have not rallied at all on, on this weather. In fact, it's been the opposite. So, yeah, I mean, we go out a few weeks, and we've still got issues. I, I just, I don't know. The, crop's, the crop will be planted, and, and what the yield will be, I, I do not know. Can't even guess. But uh, it's been a long time since we've had a yield problem. Does, does this year have to be any different? No, it, it might be the same as the last four or five years. We might be, up, be really good, have great weather, and... You know, it, it's, it could be the same. Yeah, we, as we've proven in the last few years, it doesn't take long to get a crop in the ground once we get the window to do the work. Right. Appreciate you both for being here. We'll be Thank back you. with more Ag Day in just a minute. For more information about Clipper Data and its services, contact Grains at clipperdata.com. For more information about Standard Grain and its services, call Joe at 312-462-4438. Ag Day here with Cindy Clawson as we look at the drought monitor and Cindy some of these areas including there in the south have seen rain recently. Absolutely they've seen the rain recently in some cases it's been a little bit too much though we're going to show you a little bit more about that in just a few minutes but take a look at how things have progressed over the past four weeks. And you could see that even just four weeks ago, it was still pretty dry in the Four Corners region, and we've really been seeing that rain beneficial to knocking out that drought. So we're not seeing any more extreme or exceptional drought. We've really just been knocking everything down. We still have some dry areas in the southeast. We've had some rain there as well, down into the central, or excuse me, southern plains in Texas, Four Corners region, and some still some dry pockets in the northwest. Although I imagine that we're going to see this go down even more because we had a fair amount of rain over the last week in parts of Oregon and Washington. This is what we've seen over the past week, Saturday through Friday. And yeah, we've had a fair amount of that in especially the South Central United States, but also a little bit for the further north than that, of course, with the blizzard and heavy rain conditions. But you can see many areas here had well over five inches of rain, according to our estimate. And some of those pinks in there are getting to over eight inches over the course of a week. So very, very wet conditions heading up to the northern areas. Most of this was in the form of snow. Of course, when that all melts, it's going to be a big issue as that gets into our river basins and then heading to the northwest. Yeah, we had a fair amount of rain, especially from Portland all the way down over to towards Medford, Oregon, lots and lots of rain in those areas as we head through the week. Well, we're going to be seeing another trough moving through the nation's midsection. You can see that coming down here, looking for some cooler weather and looking for some rainy conditions that it's going to be moving across the country. And by Friday, that's going to be in the east will be a little bit warmer, but then another trough starts to enter the west as we get into the latter part of the weekend and early next week. Temperatures this week 
for the most part on the cool side in much of the nation's midsection, a bit warm in the southwest and along the eastern seaboard. Precipitation this week looks like it's going to be a bit on the wet side in much of the east. Pockets of wet conditions in parts of the Intermountain West, a bit on the dry side in California. Over the next 30 days, looks a little cool in the upper Midwest over to the Pacific Northwest. The warmer air sticks into the southern parts of the country. The precipitation, a big one that we'll be watching, especially as a lot of folks are getting into planting season. We're going to be seeing some above normal moisture in the southeastern quarter of the country. Some of the Northwest as well, a little bit dry in some of the northern plains and into the far southwest. That's a look at your national forecast. Now let's check on the weather where you live. Cuesta, New Mexico, mostly sunny for you today with a high of 63 degrees. Vandalia, Illinois, mostly sunny and warmer with a high of 61. And Winterport, Maine, chilly with some rain showers and a high of 47 degrees. Still ahead, learning important life lessons by doing a little laundry, plus machinery repeat. Stay tuned, folks. Coming up, we'll talk skid steers. Ag Day, brought to you by New Delaro Fungicide for corn and soybeans. Achieve personal best yields. Thirty years tracking auction prices. One thing I can tell you, folks, and you all know this: use values connected directly to the price of new equipment. Now, one category that shows this uh, dramatically is skid steers. Now, here's an interesting look at the four highest auction prices so far this year on skid steers, and you can see the top of the heap there: fifty-nine thousand eight hundred dollars for that Kubota SVL 95 2S on an online auction out of Texas. Now, if we go back five years to 2014, here's a look at the four highest auction prices that year on skid steers and you can see 48,000 was top of the barrel at that point. Now if we go back five more years to 2009, even more dramatic, uh, here's a look at the highest auction prices that year 10 years ago, 34,500 was the top of the market. Now if we talk used skid steer values in general, here's a look at my just released first quarter uh, 2019 machine repeat used values index report on skid steers. And you can see my 8.5 rating on my 1 to 10 scale, folks, that is pretty strong. Now, to go from there to a specific recent example, here's a picture from a March 15th, 2019 Central Indiana farm auction of a 2016 Bobcat T770. This thing had 813 hours on it, sold for $45,000. And that's the third highest auction price ever on a Bobcat T770. And one other way, folks, that we can uh, see and feel uh, strong use values for skid steers is with search traffic to the listings for sale at machinerepeat.com up 49.4% versus fourth quarter and versus a year ago first quarter up 70.1%. Oftentimes folding laundry or tracking your finances is just another mundane part of our day, but it's a life skill these kids are learning in Tennessee. We'll tell you why next in the country. Closed captioning is brought to you by BASF. Grow smart with BASF. We create chemistry. Students and collegiate 4 hers at the University of Tennessee are sharing life lessons and practical skills, things not taught in classroom like handling money or how to do laundry. Charles Denny has more on adulting made easy. Mama can't do your laundry forever. So if you want clean clothes, eventually you've got to learn about detergent and what colors can go in the machine at the same time. Laundry lessons are part of a new online video series called Life Savvy 101. The audience, young adults in college or teens preparing for life beyond their childhood home. And starring in the videos and dispensing the advice, Students with UT's Herbert College of Agriculture. When you come to college, you're basically on your own now. You have to grow up and you have to check your bank statements. You have to do laundry. In terms of generational names, we're now beyond millennials. Someone born in the mid-90s is known as Generation Z. And the Zs have a name for these skills, adulting. And I don't know what I'm going to do. I've got $23 in my bank account and rent's coming up. In this video, students talk about handling money using mobile banking apps. UT Extension's Family and Consumer Sciences Unit combined with Collegiate 4-H to produce the series. Experts selected topics they believe today's youth need to learn. 
So we actually we're working in four primary areas: money, health, family, uh, or relationships, and food. And so, which are, line up with our family and consumer science and subject matter. Students should be focused on academic goals, but also learn about life as part of their college journey. Adulting is just that, picking up the skills of an effective adult. This is Charles Denny reporting. Thanks, Charles. The UT Institute of Ag is also teaming with the University of Florida in this project. The videos are still being produced and will be available soon on UT Extension's website. That's all the time we have this morning. I'm sure glad you tuned in. It's been part of your day with us. From all of us here at Ag Dan, Quentin Griffiths. Have a great day.